I came to Spengler is in fact because I also work on yeah, conceptual history. So how to perceive uh, ideas of a certain time and look at these frameworks. And I think exactly this is what Oswald Spengler did. He perceived in his own time what is what he called the Faustian culture and then yeah, tried to show to his readers what this, uh, yeah, this kind of Faustian cultures will make in history. So w what he does in his time, I try to do in my time for economic analyze, analysis and for yeah, certain features of ancient history. Yeah, why do we, Chamorosia, who is my PhD student and I, working at the Institute for the History of Ancient Civilizations, talk about Spengler writing on China or vice versa, how Spengler is received. We should or could, of course, talk about the ancient focus of Spengler. And uh, there has been already done very much. Uh, David Engels has done very much. And yesterday we also heard a lot of about the Roman law and the different perceptions of Roman law throughout the time by Professor Morgenthaler. So what is the sense of doing this here um, and especially connecting or focusing on the Weltbild, on the worldview that has been created by Spengler or by Chinese authors on that? The answer is very easy. Zhang Hongxia, she has to suffer me as a professor who is a German, ne, who demands Pünktlichkeit and Ordnung and is always eager to plan everything in advance, living in a society in China where yeah, flexibility is the most important thing ne, because many things you can't plan in advance where I regularly suffer. So this is, ne, of course, what she has to, to send. And I, myself, have been in our institute now for more than four years. I have not only seen that our students are very motivated and eager to study ancient civilizations, but also I saw that China is very different in terms of conceptions and the way of life and how scholarship is done. So I have personally benefited very much for my research questions, which uh, yeah, focus around ancient economic uh, thoughts and the theoretical reflection about that, which I have termed some years ago as Ordnungsrahmen regulatory frames, and that is based on frame analysis of Irving Goffman, where we have informations and events received by others and perceived by others by their frames of experience and expectations. And um, these uh, information you get, these events you observe, can be integrated in your frames. They can modify your frames. But on the other hand, also frames can be broken by that. For example, if I just throw here this hat, <laughs> huh? you will not expect this. But now you see it's part of the performance. Huh? And this is what I'm uh, working on. And today I want to show you shortly how we can apply this model to China Spengler. And then Chang Hongxia will talk about Spengler's China or vice versa. We will see. So to start with, there are of course other possibilities to approach how Spengler perceived China in his work. We could do a quantification. Quantification, already Spengler wrote about it. Everything is about quantification nowadays in academia. So if you look na, and type in the term in the PDF version of his work, China, it occurs more than 100 times. Chinesisch, Chinese, more than 200 times. And it's quite equally distributed throughout the work. But this does not help us very much. Um, ancient historians like for longer times uh, Quellenforschung. Ne? Where does it come from? Spengler's work is based, of course, on an examination of a vast amount of literature that we all know. Ne? Sometimes it's mentioned, sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes it's reliable, sometimes it's not reliable. 
And for China, no, if you collect that throughout the work, you will find that he knows very much about these findings in Turfan, that he quotes uh, Schindler, das Priestertum im alten China, von Rosthorn, das soziale Leben der Chinesen, Fischer, chinesische Landschaftsmalerei, the landscape painting. However, many of these mentions seem to be somehow aphoristic or topical, at least from the first sight. So for instance, when in, he talks in his introduction, uh, in his German edition, and this is now one, number one on your handout, which you have before you, this is the underlined thing, no? he says, noch leidenschaftlicher vielleicht, aber von einer anderen Färbung ist der chinesische Hang zum Sammeln. Wer in China reist, will alten Spuren, Kuzi, folgen und nur aus einem historischen Gefühl ist der unübersetzbare Grundbegriff chinesischen Wesens, Tao, Dao, zu deuten. What does Spengler want to tell us with that? He does not explain his thought, interesting so, but uh, further, or gives any kind of reference to literature, to further reading. And the reader seems somehow to be left alone with that statement. So it becomes very obvious that this is also not the, yeah, the most comprehensive approach to uh, him and to access his ideas. So what we have to do, and this is my part, is that ancient historians are used to talk about context and contextualization. And I hope I can show you that mm, even further, these regulatory frames that I talked to what is also a very important approach to understand Spengler. I suppose that Spengler was framed in these Western conceptions of this time, perceived, and I think at the least for a very great part, these frames, created his own frames throughout his work, and exactly wanted his readers to see both the contemporary and his own frames. <coughs> to follow up the example I just have mentioned, only the context of the passage reveals more about why and to what extent Ch Chinese way of traveling on old path is mentioned. So I quote now the full. Nach der Zerstörung Athens durch die Perser warf man alle Werke der älteren Kunst in den Schutt, aus dem wir sie heute wieder hervorziehen, und man hat nie gehört, dass jemand in Hellas sich um die Ruinen von Mykene oder Feistos zum Zwecke der Ermittlung geschichtlicher Tatsachen gekümmert hätte. Man las seinen Homer, aber man dachte nicht daran, wie schlimm man den Hügel von Troja aufzugraben. Man wollte den Mythos, nicht die Geschichte. Von den Werken des Eichyros und der vorsokratischen Philosophen war man schon in hellenistischer Zeit, war schon in hellenistischer Zeit ein Teil verloren gegangen. Dagegen sammelte bereits Petraka Altertümer, Münzen, Manuskripte mit einer nur dieser Kultur eigenen Pietät und Innerlichkeit der Betrachtung als historisch fühlender, auf entlegenen Welten zurückschauender, nach dem Fernen sich sehnender Mensch. Er war auch der Erste, der die Besteigung eines Alpengipfels ummahnt. Faustchen, der im Grunde ein Fremder in seiner Zeit blieb. Die Seele des Sammlers versteht man nur aus seinem Verhältnis zur Zeit. Noch leidenschaftlicher vielleicht, aber von einer anderen Färbung ist der chinesische Hang zum Sammeln. Wer in China reist, will alten Spuren folgen und nur aus seinem tiefen historischen Gefühl ist der unübersetzbare Grundbegriff chinesischen Wesens Tau zu deuten. Was dagegen in hellenistischer Zeit allenhalben gesammelt und gezeigt wurde, waren Merkwürdigkeiten von mythologischem Reiz, wie sie Pausanias beschreibt, bei denen das streng historische Wann und Warum überhaupt nicht in Betracht kam, während die ägyptische Landschaft sich schon zur Zeit des großen Tutmoses in ein einziges ungeheures Museum von strenger Tradition verwandelt hatte. End of quote. Read in context, it becomes now very clear that Spengler also guides his reader towards his idea of the different cultures already in the introduction. And their underlying principles, the ancient Greeks and Romans and their Apollinean culture, with their focus on the present and local moment and the beautiful body while forgetting history. The Faustian West with its yearning towards the past and future 
the Egyptian culture with its strict following of traditional paths. And finally, that's my topic, the Chinese culture that nestles, or at least to attempts to adapt to the overall working and guiding principle of Tao. So Spengler's basic framework here at work is what one might call alternatives. With the main aim to shape his idea of what Faustian culture is like and what not. If we follow this hypothesis throughout the work, we find explanation of why he mentions China and Chinese concept at certain points. He seemed to have, in the following of that passage, no Chinese alternative for the concept of time measuring, which he only compares between ancient cultures, where time numbers are present sizes and facts, and the running clocks of the Western culture. We heard it already yesterday and even worse, civilization, of course. But later, interestingly, interestingly, on page 175, he admits that also Mexican and Chinese might have had time measuring due to their sense of history. However, still in his introduction, he already states that our Western conception of historical categories are foreign to other cultures, among them the Chinese, page 31 giving then examples that history of Bacon uh, to Kant is not fully accessible to Chinese and other intellectuals. And although Chinese cultures experience analog morphologies, you know, which he uh, develops in the second volume mainly, also the status of expansionism, the fact of being alternative, seems to be a very strong one throughout the first volume. So, to make few examples, Chinese painting is different because the underlying mathematical principles are conceptualized in a different way. Page 221. It is the promenading in oneself that will lead to the aim instead of striving forward in a Faustian way or resting in oneself in the Apollinean way or following strictly traditional ways like the Egyptians do. Chinese architecture is also nestling to the landscape. We heard it yesterday already, page 245. We perceive Chinese music in an alternative way than the Chinese hymns as himself, and vice versa, page 250 and 293. However, Chinese culture has not taken over or remodeled other cultures. That's now very interesting. Unlike, for instance, the West that has ancient as well as Arabian elements in it. No, so the pseudomorphosis. All Chinese painting and even techniques have not the Faustian strife of direction, but strife of feeling the world, page 397. However, are still active and thus closer to the Faustian one, but the Faustian culture is even crossing boundaries of Heimat, what makes it then exceptional. Chinese physics is very different from Western ones, but not examinable anymore. And Chinese historiography has a different view of world history with a wide perspective of a row of dynasties without any end, however, not in a technical examination and globalized view like the Faustian historiography. Nevertheless, Spengler equalizes in several passages developments of Chinese culture or civilization with others as Chinese culture follows similar stages like the Faustian ones. Now, this is mainly described in the comparative form. As interesting as these comparisons are and worthwhile to consider, I want to end my part with another feature of Spengler's China, the present time or his contemporary time. Here he is very conscious to warn readers to equalize too much Western contemporary and Eastern developments. He writes on page 955 uh, while ta talking about the Jewish stagnant consensus colliding with the Faustian expansive soul. Die Römer, damals ein altes Volk, hätte nie begreifen können, was für die Juden in dem Prozess Jesu und beim Aufstand des Bar Kochba auf dem Spiele stand. Und die europäisch-amerikanische Welt hat in den verlachenhaften Revolutionen der Türkei 1908 und Chinas 1911 ihre vollkommene Verständnislosigkeit für das bewiesen, was dort vorging. Da ihr das ganz anders angelegte Denken 
und Innenleben und also auch der Staatsgedanke und die Idee der Souveränität, dort des Kaliven, hier des Tienze, verschlossen blieben, so hat sie den Gang der Dinge nicht beurteilen und auch nicht vorausberechnen können. Der Mensch einer fremden Kultur kann Zuschauer sein und also beschreibender Historiker des Vergangenen, aber niemals Politiker, das heißt ein Mann, der die Zukunft in sich wirken fühlt. Besitzt er nicht die materielle Macht, um in der Form seiner eigenen Kultur handeln und der Fremden missachten oder lenken zu können, wie es allerdings die Römer im Jungen Osten und Israeli in England durften, so steht er den Ereignissen hilflos gegenüber. Der Römer und Grieche dachte immer die Lebensbedingungen seiner Polis in die fremden Ereignisse hinein. Der moderne Europäer blickt überall durch die Begriffe Verfassung, Parlament, Demokratie hindurch auf fremde Schicksale, obwohl die Anwendung solcher Vorstellungen auf andere Kulturen lächerlich und sinnlos ist. This shows once more from my point of view that Spengler was in fact very conscious about the difficulties to understand concepts and processes of different cultures. Despite his certainly problematic views on the Jewish intervention here, which I will not deal further, he makes us very aware that uh, we cannot get objectively how other people in different cultures think, perceive and react to stimuli, stimuli from inside and of course outside. But especially the latter, the outside, is now the part of Chang Hongxia. I'm happy to be here. This conference provide, provides me a chance uh, to know uh, Spengler more. And uh, to know Spengler more provides me a chance to know um, Chinese modern history more detail. Thank you. Okay, my part uh, is China's Spengler intellectual discourses in East China, in East China, in Britain. In the second part, I shall deal with how Chinese scholars got known of, perceived, and dealt with the theory of Spengler. His idea was not spread widely and smoothly in the Chinese-speaking world, not only in mainland China in the early 20th century, but it became already known to Chinese at the beginning of the 1920s. According to the narration of scholar Li Changlin, it was first mentioned by a scholar Wang Guangqi in 19, 1920. Temporarily, there, uh, there were some Chinese articles discussing about the theory of Spengler's work. For instance, Wei Shizheng studied in Germany in 1920, published a, a diary-style article in the Association of Chinese Youth. He mentions Spengler three times and introduce a struggle between the old school and the new school. He also makes a comparison between Chinese and European scholarship by writing as follows. In the struggle between old school and the new school, the new school dominates, the old school is almost silent. The atmosphere is very opposite to our country. The reformers in our country almost all are proud of being against Confucius. However, Germans pursue the wisdom of Confucius, even treat Gu Hongmin as a severe. But until 1963, the Chinese translation of the second volume of The Decline of the West was published by the commercial press, while the first one was not. A shortened version was published in 1986 by Yuan Liu Company in Taiwan, Finally, a complete version appeared in 2006 by Shanghai Joint Publishing Press. At that time, China was in the period of the new culture movement, mainly carried out by Hu Shi, Chen Duxiu, Lu Xun, among others, who were studying overseas in order to act against Chinese traditional culture through the spread of the theory of science and democracy. With a journal called New Youth, 
It was also a chance for the theory of Spengler to be spread in China. Regarding the influence of his theory, as the work is from a Western country, it was not easily accessible to normal educated persons. However, it was read by Chinese overseas students, particularly by Li Haizong, studied in USA in 1927, Zhong Baihua studied in Germany in the 90s, 1920s, during the Republic of China. According to description of Li, Xiao, Li Xiaoqian, Li Haizong introduced the decline of the West in a European general history course at Wuhan University and a course entitled Selected Readings of Historical Classics at Tsinghua University, Peking. Li Haizong merely agrees with the basic conception, concepts of Spengler, cultural pluralism, the morphology of history. He also takes Spengler's method to divide Chinese history into period, he says as follows. He says, every kind of culture contains five different processes. The first period is the feudal age, lasting about 600 years. The second period is the patrician's age, about 300 years, a period with different independent kingdom coexisting. The third period is about an imperialistic period, 250 years, a worry, uh, a worry and a messy period, a revolution period for politics, society, and the economy. The fourth, century, uh, the fourth period is a grand unification era, around 300 years, a time of peace and prosperity after the wars. It is a time when politically despotic dictatorship rules. The social morality is declining, the culture either dies soon or stagnates for a long time. The fifth period is, a, is the last time, an end of political division and the destruction of culture. The time it lasts not sure. Obviously, Li Haizong was strongly influenced by Spengler's cultural morphology, especially influenced by the conception of the different processes of development or cultures. But he also did developed the theory of Spengler further by seeing that Chinese culture is an exception. It runs one circle by one circle, which each have, has run for two routes at this time during the war against, war time against Japan was the transitional time between the second and third route. And every route contains the aforementioned five processes. He developed the theory of Spengler as one part of his idea of a development process of Chinese history, which reflects his concerns about current events, and he tries to find a perspective for and prediction of the future of China. Compared with the acknowledgement by Li Haizong, Zhong Baihua thinks about Spengler's works in a more emotional way. He writes as, as follows. Spengler's decline of the West is a historical morphology. It is intensive and profound, and quotes compassionately <laughs> from many sources. Marx analyzes the inherent contradictions and the inevitable collapse of the modern capitalistic society in perspective of the devel development of relationship between technique and productions. But Spengler stated the tragic end, ending in perspective of diagnosis of cultural spirit. The thought of Spengler is also too much covered by the black pessimistic. The giant eyes of night of early says declined end of the city. Both scholars ha have understood the theory of Spengler, however, accepted early parts and resorted and they both noticed the pessimistic point of Spengler's theory. Li Haizong fights his own way to explain or avoid this kind of destiny, or we can see that he regards China as a, an exception. Zhong Baihua has his own further understanding about Spengler's conception with regard to a different methodological approach. 
although also in comparison with Marxism, it is hard to classify which party or theory Zhong Baihua preferred. But it shows that it was a way for scholars to think about and to access different theories at that time. So Zhong Baihua was just one of the representatives to show how scholars at that time understood and accessed them to this new theory and applied it to the current situation of and in China. Actually, within the 1920s to 1940s, a group of scholars appeared that promoted the theory of a morphology of history. And in the 1920s, it even appeared a school of warrior, worry state strategy. The members built up a fortnightly periodical with the name Warrior States, Warring States Strategy in Kunming, Yunnan Province, later a supplement in Da Gongbao. It's a magazine. Um, regular, regularly, they pu published articles to spread their ideas. As a summary, this party focused on three perspectives. A, research or the temporary global circumstance and the Chinese arty Japanese parent. B, a critic of Chinese traditional culture, nationality, and national traits. C, advocacy of developing national literature, which aimed at combining the culture movement of literature with the movement of the people. It shows that the group was already all stamped to make an impressive sight within the scholarly circle. The idea contained in the articles referred to thinking in perspective of politics, historiography, culture, literature, and art, and so on. At that time, different schools held different ideas about the future of a China state and society. After Marxism became stronger in China and took the dominant role, Marxism further developed into a kind of a political activist. So the representative of warrior states strategy were harshly criticized and punished. For the reason why the representative were criticized and even punished, it is not totally and directly connect to, connected to the theory of Spengler. It is better to say that the scholar took different ways or Western ways to think, which was against Marxism in China at that time. Before I talk about Lei Haizong's exemplary case, we must know a bit about one speech of President Mao. He said, in, he said on um, 10, 12, 12 March uh, 1957, in a meeting about the work of national propaganda, we are advocating the policy of lending a hundred schools of thoughts discuss. It is allowed for different schools, various artists to exist, but concerning worldview in modern, in modern, basically, there are two factions. One is proletariat, one is bourgeoisie. Either it belongs to pro proletariat, world, world outlook or bourgeoisie. Com communist worldview is the outlook of proletariat, not of any other classes. The most of the intellectuals now are from old society, from family of unlaboring people. Even some are from the family of workers or peasants. But they were educated by bourgeoisie theory and education. Their worldview basically is bourgeoisie. They belong to the intellectuals of bourgeois class. Under this policy, many scholars were classified as rightists. For the case of Lei Haizong, he was famous for so-called bourgeois theory, which is opponent theory of Marxism before the war of liberation, also the war against Japan. Japan. Although Lei had, had learned Marxism in a panel discussion, he presented his speech about the developing stagnation of the social science under Marxism. It was published in 21st and 22nd April 1957 
in People's Daily with an additional uh, edi editorial summary and an editor's conclusion. Mr. Lei thinks that the society, the social science, needs to be developed continuously, while in order to develop the social science, it has to be against the dogmatism. This is surely right, but Mr. Lei thinks that Lenin only has some new uh, formulations about some individual topics. Marxism stagnates basically all the base of 1895s. Those are against the reality. The editor's conclusion is that we disagree with Mr. Lee's idea. On 22nd, Lee wrote to People's Daily and provided an explanation. I agree with the editor's notes. I think also that within these 62 years, combined with the development of revolution, Marxism has developed continuously. I just propose proposed that we over ignored the further research on the experience of thousands of years before these 62 years. Li Haizong wanted to express the research problem, how to develop social science. He criticized the, the atmosphere that Marx and Engels built up the new social science on the foundation of the bourgeois social science, but after 1895, dogmatism was satisfied with the achievements of both communists without collecting the new materials and achievements, resulting in the stagnation of new so social science. In 2nd June, he gave a lecture with the topic the division, the division of the world history and some problems in ancient and medieval history. Within this lecture, he did not analyze the world history with the theory that economic base determines the superstructure. In the overwhelming trend of the political campaign, the destiny of the ind individual, a small particle swept by the political movement, he died in 25th December 1962 after having been tortured physically and mentally. The political atmosphere later up to 1976 was similar to the period of Lay's last years before dying. Since the implementation of the reform and open policy in the 1980s, Chinese scholarship has fulfilled different tasks since then on. One of this work is to understood, understand and pinpoint scholars and scholarship that were punished unjustly in the past in an as objective perspective as possible. A symbolic event was the conference Lei Haizong and the historiography in the, 19, um, in the 20th century in China at Nankai University on December 5th, 2002, at the very centennial anniversary of his birthday and the 40, 14th uh, anniversary of his death. If now we would like to discuss how the situation was going on about the theory of Spengler in China, I would like to ask in this way. When a bird's nest is overturned, is there any egg intact? Maybe this is not a 100% exact way to describe the situation of Spengler's theory in, on the reception history, but it shows the reception history of Spengler's theory in China at this time. As a conclusion, we can slightly know to which intent Spengler's thoughts were un or objectively discussed and received and resought by Eastern intellectuals. The approach to Spengler's theory is also a ref reflection of Chinese mod modern history from the 1920s to the opening time. Here, I, as a young student, I expect that we understood the hist understand the history and analyze it. If we take the mistake of the past as a kind of political mud sliding, exactly we are not better than dogmatists in the past. <coughs> exactly now in Chinese scholarship, we have thousands of translation of Western classics. Of course, the translation is not, it's only one channel for the mutual understanding. But it is quite disappointing to see the still few translations of Chinese classics into Western languages. 
maybe we as a younger generation could do something to promote the mutual understanding with a new opening, exactly like what our forerunners have done, even under such more difficult circumstances. And I hope that I could bring you closer to the reception of Spengler in China. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.